Dr. Wing is an epidemiologist at the UNC Chapel Hill School of Public Health. He has uh, studied radiation health effects for 25 years, in particular the impacts on industry workers and on communities, including uh, survivors of the atomic bombs that the United States dropped on our friends in Japan. Um, Steve led the research team from UNC Chapel Hill that performed the 1997 study, which stands as the seminal study on the health effects from Three Mile Island. It's the study that the nuclear industry hates the most because it debunked their long-running and well-crafted PR campaign that nobody was harmed there. Steve's going to talk about Fukushima and the people living near there based on his visit um, last April. So again, thanks for folks like uh, Steve Wing, uh, one of the, the very few scientists that are willing to step down from the ivory tower and help the public understand uh, what's really going on with some of these issues. So Dr. Steve Wing. So Jim mentioned I've been working on this topic for about 25 years. I got started through UNC working in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, which is where, which is one of the sites that was built at the beginning of World War II when the United States started to develop nuclear weapons. And that was my introduction to this nuclear culture that Maggie and Arnie both spoke about and, and Jim referred to as well. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about the epidemiology so much, but I, th I think it's important because this is what we live with in this country, and it's something that is shared uh, by the Japanese, and uh, for good reasons, because of our, our work there. Uh, I had the opportunity to, I've had the opportunity to go to Japan three times because I had met uh, some years ago, Katsumi Furitsu, who is a physician that has cared for A-bomb survivors. And she asked me to serve on a committee at the Radiation Effects Research Foundation in Hiroshima, where studies of radiation exposure have been going on ever since the U.S. occupation of Japan right after World War II. And she has studied uh, not only clinical issues, but she's also a geneticist and had studied the genetic effects resulting from human exposure to radiation from the accident at Chernobyl in 1986. So, uh, Earlier this year, she invited me to go to Fukushima and help her with a comparative study that she's working on comparing Three Mile Island and Chernobyl and Fukushima. Uh, all very different situations, but with some cultural similarities. And where I want to begin, actually, though, with I brought some pictures. I thought they might be fun to look at. I want to begin in 2009, which is uh, the last time before this year that I was in Japan, because Katsumi took me to an area of Japan, a province called Fukui, uh, and there's the capital city is Fukui, and there are quite a few reactors in that province, and there's a group maybe a little bit like NC Warren there that has been working to oppose uh, the nuclear power industry there in Japan. And one of the leaders of that organization took us to a couple of the nuclear plants in Fukui. Fukui is on the west coast of Japan, so it faces the Japan Sea across towards uh, the continent. And, and Fukushima is on the east coast, so we're talking about the other side of Japan. Uh, but there are some similarities. This is uh, the power uh, reactor we visited off in the distance here, and people are enjoying the beach there. 
because nuclear power is safe and uh, well integrated into the culture there. Um, and there is a wonderful visitor center in the reactor area. This is a building, about, not the reactor building itself, but uh, a, a neighboring building. And it's all set up for families to come with their children and to learn about the wonders of nuclear power. And I see Jim Warren in the back smiling, because I'm sure, Jim, you've been to the one here at the Sharon Harris plant that's, what, 15 or 20 miles from where we are right now, which has one that welcomes school children. And so does this one. And so uh, after I heard about what happened in Fukushima, I just thought back to these pictures I'm about to show you because I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I could believe it, but here is where young children sit in chairs that are shaken by an electric motor so they can experience what it would be like if there was an earthquake that shook the reactor. And here they learn that the reactors are built so that they can withstand earthquakes. There's just no way an earthquake would be able to take down such a marvel of engineering. And not only will they withstand the earthquake, <coughs> which the children are enjoying in their chairs, but the tsunami that comes after the earthquake. You can see here the reactor uh, in, in the third picture from the top, right in the middle. See the wave coming up? But that reactor is built to withstand even the greatest tsunami. And whew, you know, at the bottom, we made it through, right? So I thought about this when the news came through about Fukushima, and it's just so sad. I don't know if there was one like this at Fukushima, but I doubt this is the only plant that has one of these in Japan, because so many of the reactors are right on the ocean. Uh, for the older children, a little, you know, kind of Star Wars sort of uh, place to go in this, um, in this public area, and I also wanted to show this picture. This is the Japan Sea. And this is a plutonium breeder reactor. Look how close it is to the water. And just think about the future. And the, the, so these are reactors which have been shut down and which Japanese people and citizens' organizations are fighting to to keep from reopening. Um, so now let's move to Fukushima. Uh, I was there in um, late April, early May of this year. And unfortunately, I mistakenly erased all the pictures I took. So I got some here from the web, almost all the pictures I took, uh, to show you some of the kinds of things that I saw. Um, so. This is the tsunami damage, and, and we visited areas with, I saw train stations that were destroyed and cities and so on. The, the sides towards the ocean were destroyed. Uh, of course, where the rivers come in and valleys, uh, the tsunami went far inland compared to where there are cliffs, and so the damage went much farther from the coast at those points, and it's very impressive to see that. Um, but Maggie and Arnie uh, made a statement that I want to bring up here. Um, they said, expect the unexpected. But Arnie, based on the talk you gave earlier this year, I would say before expect the unexpected, maybe you could include expect the expected. <laughs> because as Arnie showed very clearly, the historical record in Japan is that there were bigger tsunamis than the one that took out Fukushima in the, earlier in the 20th century. So not only did the engineers expect the, not expect the unexpected, they didn't expect 
the expected. Um, so here's, here's another um, photo of, of, the of, of an area that's now been abandoned. And what's really interesting, here's a hospital, um, is, is that as you tour through this area that where people have been excluded, they're not allowed to, uh, to go back. In some areas, there, there are gates. I'll show you a gate in a minute. Uh, in other places, people are allowed to go back to, uh, say, take care of their pets. Uh, they're allowed to go back during the day. They're allowed, in some places, to go take care of their farms, but they're supposed to leave at night. And um, what's, what was amazing to me is how quickly these areas that were just a few years ago bustling places that were well tended, they, the, you know, the weeds begin to grow back, the concrete is cracking, uh, there are feral animals, uh, there's pigs and cattle that have gone back to the wild from farms there and now nobody can catch them. Um, so basically this land is, is returning to look like something that where humans have been gone for a long, long time. But it's just been two years, just over two years. Um, the arch here, there are many arches in Japan. The arch here, the translation from Ruichi Kino is nuclear power to build affluent society and town, which is how the economics are presented to us, right? Uh, and this, like, the, Japan has the most beautiful local agriculture. Everywhere people have gardens and rice paddies, and they're so beautifully kept. I have never made a wood pile that looks half as good as any of the firewood piles I saw anywhere in Japan. I mean, really beautifully tended agricultural and residential areas. And it's so clear in Fukushima now, where people have been gone for a long time, it, it, it shows so clearly, it, it, much more clearly than it would show here, I'm afraid to say. Um, so people there I met, they want to be able to practice their traditions. They want to visit the shrines to their ancestors. They want to go back to the mountains to hunt for mushrooms and pick uh, wild plants that have been part of the tradition of their families for many, many generations. And in Fukushima City, we visited a site that was opened by a clinic there that offered residents the opportunity to test <coughs> their garden produce and wild plants that they harvested for radioact radioactivity. And when I was there, a woman brought in a beautiful bunch of fragrant greens that she had harvested uh, in a rural area, wild plants. And she put them into this uh, shielded container that would detect the radioactivity. And the technician uh, ran the machine and it showed uh, both lev the levels of cesium-137 and cesium-134. They have different half-lives. They were about one-to-one -one when, uh, when the reactors melted down and the releases occurred. But because cesium-134 has a shorter half-life, you could see right on the readout, you know, it was considerably, noticeably less than the cesium-137, clear signature that the, this was a signal from that event. Um, and the, the levels were something like 10 times what the Japanese government has set as the limit for food consumption. So these are cultural practices that people value. The fishing is very important in this area. And in a lot of the areas, people are not supposed to fish anymore. Um, so this is what people have lost. Uh, Katsumi and I toured through part of uh, Fukushima with a young man who took us to areas where they're trying to decontaminate 
uh, the residential parts. And we saw many scenes like this, including one site we visited where it looked like several hundred acres had been clear cut, of forest had been clear cut in order to create a massive landfill where these uh, cubic meter plastic bags are being filled with cesium contaminated soil and they're going to be buried so that people will receive less radiation exposure when they move back. Now, what are they thinking about the future of landfills and the fact that all landfills leak and they collect leachate and animals burrow into them and they lose their structural integrity. I mean, that happens with all landfills. The amount of effort that's going into this is phenomenal. Uh, another thing Arnie talked about, it reminds me of speaking of effort, is the effort to contain the liquid wastes, uh, which is another story at the plant. Just, I mean, it's crazy what, what uh, they're trying to do. Um, the young man who took us around took us uh, to the Nagordo Gate, uh, Nagadoro Gate near Itate. And Itate was downwind from this uh, explosion that Arnie talked about earlier and was quite heavily contaminated. It's a, this, this area was a, is about 40 kilometers from the plant. And the gate is here because people are not allowed to return to their homes or to anywhere in the part of uh, Fukushima Prefecture that is behind this gate. Uh, the signs there, there are a number of signs, they don't say anything about radioactivity. Uh, the, 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 according to my translators. Um, it's about, you know, they're trying to protect from looting and what I'm sure they are. Um, but the radiation meter on the dash there is something that you see commonly. People who are staying in these areas have purchased radiation meters. They are very well aware. Some of them, uh, this young man and his father at the home that they could no longer stay in, but which they visited to feed their dog and to keep the animals out and so on. Uh, they kept records of the radiation readings in their yard, in their home. Uh, they're trying to be very vigilant to figure out what's going on so they can understand how to protect themselves. Um, this reading here is, uh, just to get, put it in perspective, uh, the guard there, if he stood there for a year, right where he is now in this picture, he would exceed the allowable radiation dose for a nuclear worker inside a plant. And this is 40 kilometers away. So, so we're talking about a, a, a sacrifice zone. And millions of people live in this, in this area. Um, so the guard, uh, can you see on the ground, behind the guard, there's a metal plate. He's supposed to stand on that metal plate. And that's his protection. And he's wearing a surgical mask. And, and he has a helmet, that helmet. And so I just, it made me uh, feel kind of bad that here is someone who is working in a radiation exposed job and he's been issued a surgical mask and a helmet uh, as though he's supposed to feel protected or something. He does have a radiation badge, he's wearing a badge, so his. Uh, readings, a dosimeter, his, his readings are presumably going into the system that they're using to, uh, to track worker exposures. But my understanding is they've hired very large numbers of temporary workers and subcontract workers who are not receiving the protections that the Tokyo Power Company employees receive. So this is one of the concerns of uh, people there in Japan is that there's a lot of unequal protection. Um, so I wanted to um, 
Oh, yes, one more picture. Um, so it, uh, as when we went to the coast, our guide was the man who's to my left. And he brought us to his family's home, which is not his home, really. It's the place they've been evacuated to. And his friend, who's on, on your far right, um, was, a, was a fisherman. And he can't fish anymore. And he grew mushrooms. And he can't grow mushrooms anymore. And they can't return home. And they're trying to make their way. But the people who can't go home, um, they, many of them, I have, I've heard, I heard stories about families that were broken, people who couldn't get decent work anymore, loss of businesses. Um, so people are essentially trading a lower level of radiation exposure, which is reduced because they're not staying at home, for loss of a lot of other parts of their lives. And this is where I guess I feel a little bad about what we do as epidemiologists. And I think sometimes we don't put our studies in perspective. So I might say from a study that we did of uh, badge monitored nuclear workers or from studies of A-bomb survivors, which are the usual method of making these sorts of calculations, that some low-level radiation dose, if you're exposed for 10 years, um, it might increase your, uh, it, the, the population exposed for 10 years would have a cancer rate that's, say, 50 percent higher than if they hadn't been exposed. And it sounds bad, and it is bad. And it means for the people who are making policy, the, the advisory committee on reactor safety or the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the government agencies that NC Warren's working with, they are potentially exposing or they are, or they are pursuing policies that could expose millions of people to low levels. And that's where there's really this 50 percent increase is really going to multiply out. But the 50 percent increase might be, if you look at it in absolute terms, that over the next 10 years, the cancer rate or the leukemia rate might go, say, from 2 per thousand to 3 per thousand of 50 percent. So 2, half of that is 1. And if you add that to 2, you get 3. So suppose the rate goes from 2 per thousand to 3 per thousand. That's a 50 percent increase. And it's going to cause a huge amount of cancer if millions of people are exposed to that additional radiation. But you know, if it were me, and I lived in Fukushima, and my family had been there for a hundred generations, and I lived on land that I'd grown up on and had a business, and that was my community, would I want to give that up to live in a resettlement camp and have to take on a different way of life and it would change my diet and my family, uh, the schools my kids could go to, whatever, if I knew that my rate of cancer would go from two per thousand to three per thousand, meaning that 998 versus 997 people would be free of cancer. And you know, when I think about it that way as a personal decision, I don't think I would want to give up all those other parts of my life, which could harm my health, to give those things up. And that's where I think there's a real um, potential for um, a misunderstanding, because I think a lot of us in the United States have been very critical, and we should be, of uh, the Japanese government, for example, for 
changing the radiation protection standards so that school kids now are allowed to be exposed to as much radiation as was allowed for nuclear workers in the past. You know, that's, that's bad. But, and it's, but it's bad, what it's bad is from a policy perspective that there are many people being exposed. But if it were me making a decision, I'm not so sure what my decision would be, whether to protect myself from that small amount of extra radiation and the increased danger of coming down with cancer that comes with that versus giving up my way of life. And the real mistake was building these reactors. That was the real mistake that doomed so many people to have to make this decision that's unacceptable. And so I just leave you with that to think that the people working on policy, like N.C. Warren and, and, the, and the Gundersons, uh, are working at the big level trying to keep this from happening to many, many, many of us, which is really important. Once it happens, I think for those of us who face a decision about to what to do in our lives, I think it would look potentially a little different. And so I would, this in a way, after meeting people there in Fukushima, it's really a plea to understand people if they would decide not to leave.